Hey everybody, this is Russ from Metro Game Core. Today we're going to do an in-depth review of the new Ambernic RG503. And in many ways, this is a device that is an improvement over previous models they've released. But I wouldn't go as far as to say this is a next-generation handheld. Instead, it appears that Ambernic is on an incremental update path. And this device is the one that honestly delivers on a lot of the things that people have been asking for over the past year. If you were looking for a bigger screen, this one's got it. And it's the first retro handheld to have an OLED display. If you're looking for a device that has a little bit more Wi-Fi heft to it, this one's got it in spades. It has 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi and built-in Bluetooth. And I think to top it off, you know, Ambernic surprised everyone with its pricing for this device. After the pricing debacle of the RG552 that was released a few months ago, this one seems to be almost a compensation for that. At $135, this is a pretty great price. And so in this video here, we're going to see if the RG503 warrants that price point. And we got a lot of ground to cover. So without any further delay, let's jump into it. Okay, so first things first, we're going to talk about some specs. The device runs an RK3566. This is a relatively new chipset, and it's the first time it's been used in a retro handheld. And one of the things that makes this chip excel is how efficient it is. The device never really seems to get hot, and the battery life on this is great. But unfortunately, it feels like they sold the RG503 a little bit short by only giving it one gig of RAM. And that's going to be fine for retro game emulation, but it does limit its capacity to be able to port over native Linux games. And on top of that, even if you were able to dual boot Android into this device, with one gig of RAM, it's probably not going to be worth it. One of the main draws of this device is the 5-inch OLED display. This is actually the same display that was used in the original PS Vita model. And so you can expect to have really vibrant colors and super deep blacks. It has a 3500 milliamp hour battery, which actually supplies between six to eight hours of battery life. That's pretty impressive. And finally, in terms of connectivity, it has five gigahertz Wi-Fi, Bluetooth 4.2, and HDMI out. Now, I recently released an impressions video, and so I recommend that you check that out if you haven't already. I'll leave a link to it in my video description. And in that video, I go fairly in depth about the controls and ergonomics of the device, so I'm not going to repeat that here. But there are a couple things I do want to mention. The first thing here is, you know, the screen here is inset into the device. This is the first Ambernic device that has that feature. And I do think it gives kind of a 90s feel to the device altogether. And honestly, the fact that they covered up the bezels on this device is a little bit jarring too. But I would say after a few days of playing it, I stopped noticing it at all. But I can understand why people would say this is kind of an ugly device. But I would say over the past week that I've been testing this thing, the design has kind of grown on me. I like the fact that it's a little bit rounded and yeah, it has a nostalgic quality quality to it. As with most other Ambernic devices, the face buttons and D-pad are up top, which gives them center stage for a lot of these systems that rely on those controls. But you do have analog sticks here on the bottom for the games that use them. Another unique feature of this device are the very shallow grips that are also textured. And it's a subtle change to their typical design, but actually I think this is an improvement. The grippiness does really improve the gaming experience, and the slight roundedness does make it feel more natural in the hands. I would say the standard setup of face buttons and D-pad feel more more ergonomically comfortable than any other Ambernic device before. But as I mentioned in my impressions video, the distance between the analog sticks and the shoulders and triggers is still a little bit larger than I would like. But honestly, I spend most of my time using the D-pad and face buttons anyway. The stereo sound that comes out of this device is some of the best that I've heard before. And it has that same dual SD card setup that are in a lot of their other devices. Also below is a function button and a reset button. And I'm not a big fan of this setup here. I would say over the past week, at least a dozen times, I've pressed the reset button instead of the function button on accident. I'm just not really sure why they put these two so close together, or honestly why they need a function button at all. For example, to exit a game, you have to press the function and then start button, and it feels kind of weird, especially considering that on most custom firmwares and on other devices, you just use select and start instead. So while I appreciate the fact that Ambernic thinks that we need a dedicated function button, I honestly feel that this is the wrong place to put it, and it's also awkward to use in general. Up top, we have some inline shoulder and trigger buttons. And like I mentioned in my impressions video, I really wish they had been stacked because I think it would have improved the ergonomics even more. Also up top, we have two USB-C ports. The left one is for peripherals and the right one is for charging. Additionally, we have a headphone jack and a mini HDMI port. And we'll test that later in this video. Now, the device ships with a stock Linux operating system based on Bodicera version 29. And the lowest price model will not come with any games. You have to add them yourself like I did here. Or you can buy the 64 gigabyte card upgrade model, which will come preloaded with some games. 
Now, one thing I noticed over my week of testing is that the device buttons are too tight against the shell. As you see here, there's a bunch of dust that's around the edges of each of these buttons. And that's because these buttons are grinding against the sides of the case. In fact, there are some times where the buttons themselves have gotten stuck. Now, this isn't a new thing to cheap Chinese retro handhelds, but it is something I've never seen with an Ambernic device before. And I wasn't really sure what was going on here, so I did a little bit of measuring. And it turns out that the size of these buttons are the exact same as they are on the other RG351 devices, which coincidentally are about a tenth of a millimeter larger than the 552 buttons. And so what it feels like here is that these buttons are just a little bit too large for the case. After a week of use, I shouldn't have this much dust around the sides of my buttons. By comparison, there is zero dust on any of my other Ambernic devices after months or even years of use. And so there might be something wrong with the size of these buttons here. And it gets really frustrating when every once in a while these buttons will stick a little bit. Honestly, it takes away from the premium experience that I typically expect from Ambernic devices. Okay, we're going to do a quick teardown here just to have a look inside. And this is what the PCB looks like once you get the screws and clips off. A couple things of note here. Here is the ribbon cable from the display, and it definitely has a different design than their other devices, probably by virtue of being a Vita screen. There's a single rumble motor here in the center, and it works okay. And my guess is under this metal shield on the right is the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth chip. Here's the antenna connector, and the antenna is secured here on the bottom right. Another thing of note are these speakers. You know, I've mentioned that these are really nice sounding speakers, and I think part of that might be due to the fact that they are kind of angled out a little bit. This is the first time I've seen it on one of these devices, and I think it probably helps with stereo differentiation. And here's a look at the battery right here. And there's a lot of empty space here. I would say that you can probably get something that's a little bit thicker as well as both wider and taller too. So that might be a fun project if we can find a battery that fits well. Okay, so before we get into game testing, I want to talk a little bit about the screen. At 960 by 544, it's actually not a very high resolution display. And bear in mind here that the vertical pixels are what matters here, so the 544. And so if we were to stick with integer scaling with something like Super Nintendo, that means that at max it can do a 2x integer scale, 586 by 448. And that's actually the same scaling that's available on the RG351 devices with their 640x480 display. And so in reality, the display resolution is not upgraded from the RG351. Now, by virtue of being a 5-inch display, you do have more vertical pixels to work with, and so you can upscale those additional 96 pixels to fill out the rest of the screen. But that is going to come at a cost, and it's going to be unbalanced pixels. Let me give you a quick demonstration of how that's all going to play out. So in the top left here, we have integer scale turned on, and I also set it to an 8 by 7 aspect ratio to make sure that the horizontal pixels were also balanced. And as you can see here, everything looks nice and square. If you look at the two black squares inside the red circle here at the top, you can see that they are balanced. Now, when upscaling to fill out the rest of the screen, it's going to create pixel distortion. On the top right, you can see here that those squares are no longer square. And so there's a couple tricks you can do to balance out those pixels, but it will also come at a cost. On the bottom left, you can see we've turned on a bilinear filter. This will balance the image, but also soften it quite a bit. And it doesn't look terrible on the actual screen, it actually gives it a kind of a retro feel, but if you're looking for sharp pixels, this isn't going to help. Now another thing you can do is turn on the normal 2x filter in addition to bilinear filter. That's what we see on the bottom right. This is going to sharpen the display, not 100%, but you know, pretty close to it, maybe 75-90% of the way there. But the problem with using filters is that they do come at a CPU performance cost. And I'll show that in a little bit more detail during the Super Nintendo section here in a minute. And you might be thinking, well, just use a shader instead. Those don't have that same CPU performance cost. Well, unfortunately, because Ambernic used a version of Botticera for their stock operating system, System, Botticera uses six preset shaders that override all of the RetroArch shaders. So unfortunately, there is no easy way to implement RetroArch shaders without manually going in and changing a bunch of configuration files. And honestly, I think that's beyond the scope of a typical retro handheld gamer. On the bright side, these things will get fixed with custom firmware sometime in the future, but as we'll discuss later on in the video, that might be a while. Okay, your head is probably swimming with all of this talk about filters and scales and things like that. Let's actually get into the gameplay now. And we'll start with some of the retro handheld systems, and these ones work great. The one downside I would say about playing things like Game Boy is the 16 by 9 aspect ratio of this system does give you pretty hefty black bars on each side. I wouldn't say it's the end of the world, but it is a good indication that this screen isn't the best for some retro systems. 
Now, for others, it's just fine. A great example is the 3x2 aspect ratio of the Game Boy Advance. And additionally, you can actually use integer scaling with Game Boy Advance, and it gives you minimal black bars at the top and bottom, too. And so honestly, this is the only system where I didn't have to mess around with shaders and filters and all that other stuff. Because all you have to do is just turn on integer scaling and you're good to go. Sadly, that's kind of a rare thing with this device. For all the rest of the systems, I used that bilinear filter turned on, as well as that normal 2x filter too. And for all the low-end systems, things like Nintendo Entertainment System, absolutely no problem. These played just fine, the pixels are nice and balanced, and the screen is relatively sharp too. And on top of that, the colors of this OLED panel have to be seen to believe. They're really nice looking. And so I had a good time testing a lot of my NES catalog. The games look good, they play really well, and thanks to the fact that it has that internal Wi-Fi, you can knock out a bunch of retro achievements too. And same thing with the Sega catalog too. Genesis, Sega CD, 32X, all these were a lot of fun too. When it comes to Super Nintendo, most of the games are going to play just fine using that normal 2x filter that I mentioned before. And if you want, you can also step it up and use some of the more CPU intensive filters too. For example, you can use some of the Blarg filters, which will give it a more retro video signal. And so if you wanted to mimic that composite or S-video feel, you can definitely do it with most Super Nintendo games. But not all of them will work well with a filter. Even the title screen on Yoshi's Island can't reach 60 frames per second with any filter enabled. Now you can turn them off and it'll be just fine, but at that point you'll be dealing with unbalanced pixels. But the games that do require you to turn the filters off are relatively few and far between. It's mostly going to be Yoshi's Island, Star Fox, Super Mario RPG, and Final Fantasy VI. Those were the only ones where I had to turn the filter off, all the other ones played just fine with it on. Okay, let's move on to some of the more intense systems. We're going to start with Nintendo DS. And unfortunately, they're using a version of Drastic on this stock operating system that is not very well optimized. And so while I wasn't surprised that games like Golden Sun Dark Dawn didn't play at full speed, unfortunately, almost every Nintendo DS game didn't play at full speed either. Even something like Mario Kart DS, which plays just fine on the RG351 devices using custom firmware, struggled to reach 100% speed. And so unfortunately, at least with the stock operating system, system, you're not going to really enjoy playing Nintendo DS on this device. Moving up to PlayStation 1, this one plays just fine. Even the hardest games to emulate, things like Tekken 3, played at 100% full speed, even when turning on the high resolution option within RetroArch settings. And so I would say across the board, PlayStation 1 is going to be just fine on this device, even at a 2x resolution. Moving over to Arcade, it was kind of a mixed bag. Anything up to Capcom Play System 3, so your Street Fighter 3 games and whatnot, they're all going to play fine, 100% speed, no problem there. But unfortunately, this new chipset is not strong enough to play through Killer Instinct at all. In fact, I was hovering around 25 frames per second, which is pretty terrible. Now, thanks to the dual analog setup, you can go through and change the options to rotate the screen within arcade games, and it actually works out pretty well. You do have to remap the controls to make the right analog stick mimic the D-pad, but overall I found it to be an enjoyable experience. And because this device is relatively lightweight, it doesn't feel heavy in your hands to hold it at a vertical orientation like this. And so if you want a device with a very nice panel that can play vertical arcade games, this is a pretty good choice. All right, so now let's talk about the ones that don't play so well. We're going to start with Nintendo 64 here. And this isn't so much about the systems themselves, but more about the operating system that ships with the device. If you go into game settings and then go into per system advanced configuration, within here you'll have a choice of emulators for each of these systems. And Nintendo 64 has six different options in here, two RetroArch cores and then four standalone versions too. And while I appreciate the appearance of choice here when it comes to these emulators, the honest truth is that each one of these standalone emulators for Nintendo 64 are basically unplayable. Some of them will crawl at like 5 frames per second, others will just outright crash, and even then some of them won't scale correctly so they'll only show up on part of the display. And these are the same issues that happened on the stock firmware of the RG552. In reality, the only options you have for emulating Nintendo 64 are the two RetroArch cores, and these two are far from efficient. In fact, the performance on these two on the RG503 is significantly worse than on the RG351 using custom firmware. And so at this time, at least with the stock operating system that ships with this device, I would actually consider Nintendo 64 to be unplayable on the RG503. And so I don't really want to speculate about the ability of Nintendo 64 to be playable in the future, but I will say at least as a day one purchase, I would not have high hopes for this system. 
And the same goes with Sega Saturn, in fact it's actually a little bit worse. Not only do the games play excruciatingly slow, but there's only one emulator available, and it actually doesn't say what it is in the Bodicera settings, but it seems to be a standalone version of Yabazan Shiro. Regardless, the performance is terrible on it, and none of the hotkeys work either. So there's actually no way to enter a menu or exit a game or anything else like that. Your only option is to reset the console every time you're done playing a terrible Saturn game. As you can imagine, that's super disappointing. Okay, so let's move on to Sega Dreamcast. You have two options here when it comes to emulators. You have a standalone Flycast, which will crash every time you try to use it, or you can use the Flycast core within RetroArch. And like with Nintendo 64, this one is not very well optimized either. And so some Dreamcast games will be playable, and I would say the performance on this is a little bit better than it was on Nintendo 64, and probably a little bit better than it was on RG351 devices too. But all the same, it's not great. You're going to experience a lot of slowdown and a ton of audio stuttering too. But one nice thing about using the Flycast core within RetroArch is that you can turn on a widescreen hack, which is going to make some of these games look pretty cool. Same goes with the Dreamcast-based arcade systems like Sega Naomi or Atomus Wave. These will use the same Flycast core and the performance will be just about the same as it was on Dreamcast 2. But you know, I think this system that a lot of people are interested in with this device is the Sony PSP. And that makes sense because this is a perfect 2x scale of the original PSP display. And so a lot like with the RG351P or the M, which was a 2x scale of the Game Boy Advance screen, I think a lot of people were thinking this is going to be the perfect PSP device. And if you watch some of the promotional materials for this device, everything looked really good. For example, Soul Calibur Broken Destiny runs at a 2x resolution and it mostly plays at full speed too. And there are going to be a couple games that do play at this resolution and speed as well. Crash Tag Team Racing is a good example. But honestly, that's going to be a very small amount of games, probably about 10% of the catalog. For the remaining 90% of the catalog, you're not going to be able to do anything better than a 1x resolution. And even then, about half of the games aren't going to play at full speed. And so as it stands out of the box with the stock firmware operating system, you're not going to get very good PSP performance. And you might be able to fix some of these with adding a frame skip on here, but I think that's going to actually disappoint a lot of players. It's just kind of disappointing to make a bunch of compromises on a device that seems like it was made for PSP. Probably the best example I can give you is God of War Chains of Olympus. As a baseline, here's the PlayStation Vita running that game. And while it only runs at a 1x resolution, it plays smooth as butter. Now let's try to do that same setup on the RG503, a 1x resolution running with no frame skip. And as you can see, it only reaches about 33% speed altogether. Now there are some workarounds you can do within the emulator, for example you can cap the frame rate to 30 frames per second, and then also turn on a frame skip of 1. So essentially you're playing the game at 15 frames per second at that point. And yes, it plays at relatively full speed, but running this game at 15 frames per second is a real disservice to the game itself. So, long story short, despite the fact that this has the PS Vita's OLED display, this device is simply not capable of playing PSP. Okay, a couple features I want to show off before we start wrapping up. The first is using this device for game streaming. Within the settings, it does have a pairing menu here, which will allow you to pair with your computer, either using Moonlight if your computer has an NVIDIA GPU, or through Sunshine if you're using an AMD one. And I have a whole Moonlight video on this channel if you want to learn more about this. But long story short, I was able to pair the device to my computer, and after that it'll create a Moonlight menu for you as you see here. But I gotta be honest, it was super finicky. There were a few times where I was able to actually connect to my computer and open up Steam Big Picture, but I never got it to recognize my controls. And more often than not, it would crash every time I tried to use it. And so while I'd love to say this is going to be a great device for streaming, at least on the stock operating system, that wasn't my experience. Now one thing that did work really well is the HDMI out capability of this device. I'm just going to use a mini HDMI to HDMI adapter here, and then I'm going to plug this into my capture card. Now to get HDMI working you have to plug it in while the device is turned off, and then when you turn it on it's going to boot directly into the HDMI output instead. And it works really well, it scales to 16x9 just like a standard TV or a monitor, and despite the fact that I detected some input delay, I would not consider it to be game breaking. And so I think that if you are looking for a device to play on the TV, this one actually works really well. <laughs> 
And one of the cool features about Botticera is it does have a Bluetooth controller option. And since the 503 does have a Bluetooth chip inside, it's actually very easy to pair it to an external controller. And so here I am with a two player setup. All I did here was pair the Bluetooth controller to the device and everything else worked right out of the box. Player one defaulted to the device itself and then player two was the Bluetooth controller. And so honestly, this is the first Amronic device that is a really viable product when it comes to two player gameplay on a TV with a retro handheld. The experience was really easy to set up and the input delay was not bad at all. So if you're looking for a retro gaming console hybrid, this one actually fits the bill pretty well. Okay, we've been at this for a while now. Let's start wrapping things things up with what I like and what I don't like. Now starting with what I like, I'm a big fan of the screen quality. Having an OLED panel to play your retro games is a really nice experience. The colors just pop out of the screen and the blacks are super dark. I also appreciate that they've improved the ergonomics from previous devices. It no longer feels like you're holding a brick as you're playing it. And I do think the price on this device is pretty decent. They're retailing it at $150, but then also marking it down to $135. My hope is that they keep it to $135 for the indefinite future. And I was actually surprised by that price. I was expecting it to be about $175 or even higher. And so in that regard, I think that Ambernick has a win here. And like I just showed, you know, the HDMI and Bluetooth combination makes this the first Ambernick handheld device that can easily function as a retro console too. The five gigahertz Wi-Fi is a welcome addition and I hope they continue to use that in future products. And the battery life on this is great. I got over six hours of game time every time I tested it. And finally, I think the audio quality is some of the best I've ever seen in an Ambernick device. So those are the things I like about the RG503, but there are quite a few things I don't like about this device. Let's get into those. Number one, the performance on this device is disappointing. The thing about 16x9 devices is that you need to put enough power in there to play 16x9 games. And theoretically, the only 16x9 system that plays on this device is the PSP. And as we saw, PSP gameplay is nowhere near good. And so it just kind of leaves me scratching my head why use a display like this in the first place. If you can't take advantage of that aspect ratio, then it's kind of a waste. And speaking of a waste, the stock operating system on this is just as bad as it was on the RG552. I gotta hand it to them, they made a couple improvements. For example, sleep function now works. But there are just so many small configurations and oversights within that stock operating system that I actually find it kind of frustrating to use in the first place. Now I gotta hand it to Ambernick, they did try to get custom firmware developers involved in the rollout of this device, but unfortunately a lot of those efforts are not really apparent to the end user. A good example is the fact that the RK3566 chips in this device is relatively new on the market. And so because of limitations associated with a new chip like this, Ambernick is not going to be able to release the source code for a while, which means that it's going to delay the initial development of custom firmware. So long story short, I wouldn't expect to see something like Amber Alec or Jealous on this device for another few months. And so yet again, we've fallen into the same trap where Ambernick releases nice hardware, but the software is terrible and the community has to swoop in and fix things. But because of those source code limitations, it might take a little bit longer than usual. And so honestly, I wouldn't expect this device to hit its prime until late summer. And I think that's something that early adopters need to keep in mind. Now moving on, another thing about this device is despite the fact that it does have nice ergonomics and a beautiful screen, it actually lacks the premium feel that I would expect in Ambernick devices. Most especially those face buttons that kind of grind against the side of the case for me. This is the first Ambernick device that as I was playing it, I thought to myself, ah, this kind of sucks. And that's never really happened to me with an Ambernick device. That's typically something I would say to myself while I'm playing a Pow Kitty or a Retroid handheld. And so unfortunately, I think when it comes to that premium experience we've all come to expect from Ambernick, this is the first device in the modern era that hasn't hit that mark. And a few more things, the one gigabyte of RAM on this device is gonna be very limiting in the future. For example, we recently got Celeste working on retro handhelds and I'll make a video about that next week. But unfortunately that game requires more than a gig of RAM just to boot. And so as it stands, the only Linux based device that can play that Celeste port is the RG552. And I would have loved to have played that game on an OLED display like this one. And so that's a huge bummer to me. And finally, I'm not a fan of that function button on the bottom. I think it's just a waste to have it there in the first place. And at some point, Ambernick needs to fix these inline triggers. They make a lot of sense on a three and a half inch display device because it does make the device more pocket friendly. But I think once you get to that five inch display territory, you know, something that's not quite as pocketable, I think that stack shoulder buttons should become the standard. And so with the RG503, much like with the RG552, the inline triggers here are a negative. Okay, so those are all the things I like and dislike about the device. And usually around here, I start to talk about whether or not you should buy it. 
And so to address that, we're going to do something a little bit different. I'm calling it the hot takes lightning round. So I'm just going to give a series of hot takes about this device that are 100% based on my own opinion, but I'm hoping these little bits of insight will help you decide whether or not you want to pick this device up. I think this is going to be pretty fun, so let's get started right now. Okay, hot take number one. I think this device is an improvement in almost every single category over the RK3326 devices like the RG351 series, as well as the Palkitty RGB10, Max, and 2, and all that stuff. Each one of the RK3326 devices had some sort of glaring issue. Sometimes it was a lack of Wi-Fi or no stereo speakers, or maybe it just wasn't very comfortable to hold. Either way, in all of those respects, the RG503 is an improvement. However, I'm not sure that it's worth $135 to upgrade from a 351 device to this one. And that's mostly because the performance on this one is not that much better. Custom firmware might be able to improve that in the future, but at this time, so early in the game, I wouldn't make that bet. Okay, hot take number two. Other than battery life, color saturation, and ergonomics, I think that the RG552 is a way better device than the RG503. A lot of that has to do with the fact that the 552 has been out for about five months at this point which means that it has mature custom firmware already available. Both Jealous and Amber Alec are wonderful on this device, and it can dual boot into Android. And the Android 9.0 version that's been released by Black Seraph really improves the performance on it, to the point that I would consider Dreamcast, Sega Saturn, Nintendo 64, and even most PSB to be completely playable. And you can take advantage of all the things that Android can provide. For example, you can do streaming with Xbox Game Pass or Stadia, and you can also stream media on it. Things like Plex work really well. Now, the RG552 is not a perfect device. The battery life on it is only about two or three hours altogether, and it is heavy, but it is a nice solid feel. But, you know, the biggest drawback is that it still costs $227. If this thing cost under $200 or even $175, I think it would be no contest. But really, the screen is what sets this device apart. Let me show you a quick example. Here's Final Fantasy III running on the Super Nintendo. Up top, we have the 503 running with integer scaling off, bilinear filtering on, and the normal 2x filter. Below, we have the 552 just running with integer scaling on. Now, the 503 requires that filter in order to balance the pixels, but it will come at a performance cost. As you can see here, it's not running at 60 frames per second. Meanwhile, the 552, by virtue of having a 1920 by 1152 display, can actually run at a 5x integer scale with minimal black bars at the top and bottom. This is going to give you a pixel accurate representation with no performance degradation by having to use a filter. Meanwhile, the 503, by only having a 960 by 544 display can only manage a 2x integer scale and then also has to upscale those additional 96 pixels. That'll result in a worse quality display and degraded performance as we can see here. And thanks to a 5x3 aspect ratio of the RG552, the display is a little bit taller which means you're going to have thinner black bars on the left and right. And earlier, you know, we talked about all those scaling issues that happen on the 503 and how there's basically no one perfect way to display everything. On the 552, you're going to get perfect integer scaling with nice chunky pixels and everything else. And so I think when it comes to comparing the 552 and the 503, hands down, I prefer the 552. Okay, hot take number three, the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus at $99 before shipping is still a way better deal than the RG503. The Retroid Pocket 2 Plus can play through Nintendo 64, Dreamcast, PSP, all of those with relatively little issues. And because it's Android based, it means you can do streaming and all that other stuff very easily. But if I had a gun pointed to my head and someone said you had to pick one of these to take on vacation with you, I honestly don't know which one I would pick. Sure, the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus can play Dreamcast and Nintendo 64 really well, but I'm a child of the 80s. I really do prefer Nintendo and Super Nintendo. And in that regard, I'd rather use the 503. It's got a bigger display, the colors and saturation are much better, and the D-pad and face buttons are front and center on the device. And so while I freely admit that the Retroid Pocket 2 Plus is a better deal all around, I'm probably going to get more use out of the 503 than that one. Okay, moving on, hot take number four. If you're really into PlayStation Portable and you think the 503 display looks really nice, then the best thing you can do is just go and buy yourself a used PS Vita. You can typically find the OLED model for between $150 and $200. And if you don't already have one, this is probably the best way to play the Sony handheld catalog. Because in addition to having a native PSP environment through the Adrenaline app, you also have the entire PlayStation Vita catalog available to you too. And this catalog can't be played on any other device. In addition to having a lot of my favorite indie games, there also are a lot of remastered version of PS2 games available too. 
So you can play through Final Fantasy X or Final Fantasy X 2 and even the first two God of War games as well. And so I think rather than lamenting the fact that the RG503 can't really play PSP, I think your energy is going to be best served by just getting a PS Vita and loving every minute with it. Okay, and my final hot take here, and this really isn't that much of a hot take, the RG503 cannot compare to the AYN Odin at all. And I haven't done a lot of Odin content lately, and part of that is because I got the Steam Deck and that took up a bunch of my time. But also, about a month ago, I put Windows on this device, and I've really enjoyed it. And I just really haven't gotten around to putting Android back on it. And so yes, I'll make a video about Windows on the Odin here pretty soon, and then I'll get Android back on it and I'll make my starter guide. But that's all beside the point. The point here is that the 503 just can't compare to the the awesome power of the Odin. Not only can the Odin play all the devices that the 503 struggles to play, you can go well above and beyond that. A good amount of the GameCube and PS2 catalog are completely playable on this device, sometimes at even a 2x resolution. And it's capable of playing most every Android game available in the market. And thanks to the really nice control setup and 5 GHz Wi-Fi, it's an excellent streaming device too. And so if you're only going to be buying one retro handheld, I still think that the Odin is the one to get. But you're going to be waiting a long time to get your hands on one. I would say that if you ordered an Odin right now, I'd expect it to take at least three months and even maybe as long as six months to actually arrive. And during that wait time, you're probably going to want to play some video games. And so in that regard, you know, $135 for the RG503 is actually not that bad of a deal if you just kind of consider it to be a loner device as you're waiting for the next one. So those are my five hot takes, and I hope that they helped you in your buying decision for the Ambernic RG503. At the end of the day, I do think this is a pretty good device. And if it wasn't for the RG552, I could easily say this is the best Ambernic device yet. But as it stands, this isn't the best device out there in the market today. There are quite a few others that are more powerful and more capable and even better priced. And so at the end of the day, do I actually recommend you buy the RG503? And of course, as always, that's going to depend. If this is your very first retro handheld ever, sure, this is a pretty good device. And I do think it's only going to get better once custom firmware does unlock the potential of this hardware. But my prediction is that's going to be several months off. And so if you already have an RK3326 device, is it going to be worth the upgrade? Honestly, I think only time will tell. But as it stands right now with the firmware we do have available on this device, I would say it might be worth it to just wait and see. Anyway, that's it for this video. I appreciate you watching through to the end. This has been a really long one. But let me know what you think in the comments below. Is this a device you're considering or do you think it's wiser to hold off? As always, thank you for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe if you found this helpful and we will see you next time. Happy gaming.